The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. In Jesus' time, and even now, synagogues and temples were and are highly organized structures that include where God is considered to be present. This area was approachable only by those who were spiritually clean. Some Christian churches have a similar setup. For example, the Catholic Church, where the unused but consecrated bread is held. Other Christian denominations may not have some physical structure where we place God, but there is a continued feeling that somehow God is localized in our churches. But what we see in this first chapter of Mark, the very in, getting toward the very end of it, is that this is not Mark's understanding. And throughout Jesus' ministry and healing, yes, he started in the synagogue. That's the story we heard last week with the healing of the man with the demon. But Jesus quickly moved into the world. Jesus did not sequester himself into an outwardly acknowledged holy space and then have people come to him for healing or teaching. He actively went out into the neighborhoods. So Jesus starts his ministry in the expected place the synagogue, which was the cultural and religious center of the community. But then, he disrupts the expectations by be performing a healing miracle in a private home. And even more, performing one of his earliest miracles on a woman. From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was pushing the boundaries. From the start, Jesus is breaking down the barriers of social convention by also showing God's power through him by curing illnesses and casting out evil. Nothing could be victorious over the power of God. Nothing can be victorious over Jesus' healing work. And this was true then, and it's still true today. Because, as I have said a variety of times before, the kingdom of God is now. And it comes to fruition through us. And of course, where the kingdom of God is, there is new life, freedom, and the call to serve. In today's Gospel lesson, one phrase that should catch our attention is how Mark describes what Jesus does for Peter's mother-in-law. 
Mark writes that Jesus takes her by the hand and raises her up, and then the fever left her. When studying Mark, we know that he uses the word for raise up several times throughout his gospel. And most significantly, he uses that word to describe what happens on Easter morning when Jesus was raised up. This, in a sense, is like a minor resurrection. She wasn't dead, but she was extremely ill. I think most of us, if not all of us, know how much an illness can negatively affect what we are able to do and even how we feel about ourselves and about our place in community. I remember last May when I had COVID. I felt so isolated and really upset that I was not able to do my work. I was just installed as your pastor and all I could do for a week was sit in my bedroom and wait until I could go back out. Fortunately, I was fully restored to health and could continue my work. When Jesus cured Peter's mother-in-law, he raised her up and he restored her. She was fully restored and so much so that she was able to use her gifts and she did this by serving others. And this wasn't service in the patriarchal understanding of a woman's place being in the home to serve others, but serving by providing hospitality to the guests in her home, including Jesus. This woman is one of the first examples of discipleship in Mark's Gospel. Because her health was restored, her status in the community, well, what it was for a woman of the time, was also restored. Relationships were healed and strengthened. And as disciples of Jesus, who follow his example, we can see our ministry as that of raising people up. Of course, in the more figurative sense of that phrase, it is not just about providing for others' needs or making others comfortable, both of which, of course, are very important. But we are called to do more than that. We are called to raise people up so that they can use the gifts and talents that God has given them. And we are called to help those who have no place in community to have their place restored because we are all children of God. Of course, doing this does mean more than just a handout or a stopgap measure stopgap measure. And it's not an easy calling, but it is our calling as followers of Christ. And we see further in this gospel lesson that Jesus doesn't just heal one person, because very soon every neighbor with some kind of illness is showing up at the door of Simon and Andrew's home to be healed by Jesus. The whole city comes out to witness this. Word traveled very fast. And Jesus was kind and gracious to them. And unlike most large medical groups who might ask, who's your insurance carrier? Or how much is your healing worth? Jesus did not expect payment. He simply heals them all, or at least many of them, as the Gospel says. Jesus endured this endless supply of want from his people. He dealt with them most of the night. 
It says that that evening he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. The people who came to him were simply looking for healing of their bodies. But Jesus was doing more. Those acts of healing people did more than heal the physical illnesses. Opening up a clinic and offering free healing would have been enough for that. But he also, from the very start, was heading toward the cross to heal the ultimate relationship that between people and God, that relationship that is hindered by sin. As we might expect, after spending much of the night healing all of the sick people in Capernaum, he was pretty tired. So early in the morning, he goes out to a private place to pray, to be alone with his thoughts, and with God. And then, once the disciples find him, he says, it's time to go out into the neighborhoods. He had his talk with God, his time to process what the night before had brought and what God had sent him to do. And it was time to get up, get prepared, and go out into the world Staying in the safety of the synagogue, teaching, or in Peter's house, healing, could have been very tempting. But there was more that needed to be done. Jesus needed to get the message out about God's love for even those who were shunned and hated by the world. That message that tells us that following him means that we need to go out into the neighborhoods and raise up those who have been trampled down by society, by illness, by anything else that weighs people down. And we still need to provide the kindness and care that we have provided for so long. <coughs> Excuse me. Because immediate comfort and alleviation of pain is also important. So, sisters and brothers in Christ, we are called to work together and find a way to do this work, continue to do this work in our neighborhood, to be that small but mighty congregation. And I do trust that as we follow this call, God will be right there keeping us going. Amen.